All right, welcome. My name is Erin McDonald, and I'm going to be giving the fall lecture series on understanding post-traumatic stress disorder. So we're going to be starting with part one of the videos, which is what is post-traumatic stress disorder? First, I will introduce myself. My name is Erin. I'm currently completing my PhD in clinical psychology at McGill University, and I am an intern therapist at the Emotional Health CBT Clinic. So the outline for the presentation, we're gonna be starting with part one where we're going to be understanding what is PTSD. So we'll give a brief history of PTSD. We'll review the symptoms of PTSD. So we'll be going over kind of an exhaustive list of the different symptoms that we might see. Going over comorbid disorders. So other psychological disorders that might occur alongside PTSD. And then finally, going over who may develop PTSD and how we can understand some of the risk factors associated with it. And then in part two, so the second video, we'll be going over the treatment using CBT to treat PTSD. So first, what is post-traumatic stress disorder? So this is the presence of psychological symptoms following a traumatic event that's either been experienced by yourself or witnessed happening to another person. What we see with PTSD is the presence of intrusive symptoms, avoidance of things that might be relating to the event, negative changes in thought or in mood, and changes in arousal and reactivity. So if some of these things aren't quite making sense yet, don't worry, we're gonna go over them in great detail shortly, just to give a general sense of what we might expect with somebody who's going through PTSD. What we also see is that the symptoms have lasted at least one month and that they're causing an impairment in daily functioning. So to give a brief history of PTSD, in 1915, the term shell shock was used to describe veterans after World War I. So this term was actually coined by the soldiers themselves. The symptoms included things like fatigue, tremors, confusion, nightmares, and impaired sight or hearing. And the way that it was really understood was that there was a difficulty functioning or a complete lack of functioning with no obvious physical cause. So these were survivors of the war that hadn't been physically injured in a way that might explain what they were going through, but we were seeing this series of symptoms. And what we saw at that time as well was the introduction of a lot of stigma. It was explained as cowardice or things like that. And a psychologist at the time actually understood this as this might be a way that soldiers are processing the trauma that they had experienced in active combat. And we now understand this as one of our earliest understandings of post-traumatic stress disorder. And in fact, some of the techniques that were used to treat the soldiers with shell shock at that time kind of laid the foundation for the treatments that we use to this day. And then jumping ahead a little bit, post-traumatic stress disorder was formally introduced into the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, third version in 1980. So there was a kind of a long period of time between understanding it as shell shock and then understanding formally post-traumatic stress disorder. And so now I'm gonna go through what are the different symptoms that we would see? What are the diagnostic criteria that we can understand with somebody who's experiencing post-traumatic stress disorder? And the first is exposure to a traumatic event or multiple traumatic events. So a traumatic event is defined as an exposure to actual or threatened death, serious injury or sexual violence. And this can happen in a number of ways. So it might be that you yourself have directly experienced this traumatic event. This is the one that we think of most commonly when we think of PTSD, that when you yourself has, have gone through a traumatic event that we might see it's likely that symptoms develop, but that's not the only way that it can occur. So what we also understand is that witnessing in person this event occurring to somebody else might also be a risk for um, increased PTSD. Uh, similarly, learning that the event has occurred to a close loved one. So in this case, not necessarily witnessing the event in person, but learning that a close loved one has gone through a traumatic event uh, 
And then finally, experiencing repeated or extreme exposure to the aversive details of traumatic events. Uh, so for example, what we might see here and what we have seen is with first responders. So these are people that, as we know, particularly in the context of COVID, that first responders are often dealing with traumatic events. So exposure to death, exposure to serious injury, and they might be exposed to it on a daily basis, witnessing that event occurring to somebody else as a part of their job. And so prolonged exposure to these types of traumatic events can also increase somebody's risk for developing post-traumatic stress disorder. And so now I'm gonna go over these intrusive symptoms. So intrusive symptoms that are relating to the traumatic event. And so people with post-traumatic stress disorder might experience one or more of the following intrusive symptoms. So it might be that they're having recurrent involuntary and intrusive distressing memories about the event. So things that it feels like they can't control, but kind of replaying memories of that traumatic event in their mind. Similarly, uh, recurrent distressing dreams about the traumatic event, experiencing flashbacks. So kind of taking that recurrent memory to another level where you might be acting or feeling as though that traumatic event is reoccurring, uh, experiencing intense or prolonged distress at exposure to internal or external cues that symbolize or resemble an aspect of the event, and similarly a psychological reaction to these cues that symbolize or resemble an aspect of the traumatic event. And so we can kind of understand these last two if you've ever heard the term uh, trigger or trigger warning we can understand these last two as what we might call triggers so when somebody with who's been through a traumatic event who has ptsd is exposed to something that perhaps reminds them or symbolizes that traumatic event it might cause intense distress beyond what we might expect given that stimuli or a, uh, an intense psychological reaction. What we might also see is avoidance of stimuli that are associated with the traumatic event. And so this might be avoidance a little bit internally, avoidance of distressing memories, avoidance of thoughts or avoidance of feelings that are kind of about or closely associated with the traumatic event. So, um, very internal, avoiding your own memories, your own thoughts, we might see it go a little bit more external. So avoiding external reminders that arouse distressing memories, thoughts, or feelings about the traumatic event. So this might look like avoiding people, places, or conversations, avoiding certain activities, certain objects, or certain situations. So we might also see negative changes in cognitions and mood. So these are things that we often see there's been a change after the traumatic event has occurred. So including potentially things like an inability to remember an important aspect of this traumatic event. So we often see this as a bit of a protective function of the brain. If there's been an event that has been incredibly distressing, we see that the memory often changes around it and people might experience what they kind of describe as a blank space in their memory or blackout of their memory where they can't remember the event happening. Uh, we might also see exaggerated negative beliefs about self, others, or the world. Um, so potentially, you know, we might understand these as beliefs like the world is a dangerous place and I'm not safe following an, a traumatic event. We might see distorted cognitions about the cause or the consequence of the traumatic event. So what this often looks like is blaming oneself or blaming others. So maybe something like, you know, if I hadn't have been there, then this car accident wouldn't have happened. And so it's my fault. We might also see a persistent negative emotional state. So kind of a consistent low mood, a diminished interest or participation in significant activities. So maybe kind of a lack of joy or pleasure in things that used to bring you joy, maybe not engaging in activities that you used to really enjoy, not feeling that interest or not wanting to participate in them any longer feeling detached or estranged from others. So we can understand that this might have pretty significant relationship, uh, pretty significant impact on relationships if you're feeling detached, like it's difficult to engage with the people that are important to you. And then finally, a persistent inability to experience positive emotions. So all of these sort of fall under this negative thoughts and negative mood following the traumatic event.
And then finally, we see alterations in arousal and reactivity. So when we just talk about arousal, we mean kind of levels of energy or emotion in ourselves and reactivity being the way that we react to, you know, our own thoughts or others. So we might see irritable behavior and angry outbursts. So typically expressed as verbal or physical aggression towards people or towards objects. We might see reckless or self-destructive behavior. We might see hypervigilance. So this is this feeling that people describe of being kind of hyper aware, constantly on alert. It's sort of our body's way of putting us into protective overdrive. If we believe that the world is not a safe place, we've in fact experienced that the world is not a safe place. Our bodies might be in overdrive trying to protect us from any possible danger. Uh, we might also see an exaggerated startle response. So if somebody's standing too close to me or comes up to me from behind, maybe an exaggerated more than what you might expect given the situation. Also might see problems with concentration and sleep disturbances, so difficulty falling or staying asleep and restless sleep. And so all of these are sort of the various symptoms and we would typically see at least one or two from each of these areas in somebody with a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder. And so going through these a little bit exhaustively, you can imagine that somebody dealing with sort of experiencing the traumatic event and then experiencing the presence of these symptoms afterwards can create a lot of distress. And we also see that post-traumatic stress disorder is concurrent, it often occurs alongside other disorders. And so what we might see is that somebody with post-traumatic stress disorder might also have a diagnosis of anxiety or symptoms of anxiety, of depression, of a panic disorder, or of substance use. And finally, we'll discuss a little bit about who is impacted by post-traumatic stress disorder. And so what we see is that about 6% of the population in total is impacted by post-traumatic stress disorder over their lifetime. And when we look at people that have experienced a traumatic event, we see that those numbers go up quite a bit. So if we look just at people that have experienced a traumatic event, we see that between maybe 25% to 50% of people who have been exposed to a trauma will go on to develop post-traumatic stress disorder. And there's some differences and some risk factors associated with what makes the difference, why some people maybe are more likely to develop post-traumatic stress disorder and why others aren't. And so the first is pre-traumatic risk factors. So these are the things that are in place before the traumatic event occurs. And so what we know is that having those sort of personal factors that might weigh in. So um, somebody's own history of mental health, people with maybe mental health disorders, particularly ones that have been diagnosed in childhood, might be at an increased risk of experiencing post-traumatic stress disorder. We also know that people who have experienced traumas in the past, particularly people that have experienced childhood traumas, might also be at an increased risk of experiencing post-traumatic stress disorder. There's also environmental factors that can become really important. So kind of the socioeconomic status as well as the type of environment uh, that you live in. And so environments that are more supportive kind of create more resilience, um, but environments where maybe there's a little bit more chaotic, maybe it's less stable, we might see that those individuals are at higher risk of developing post-traumatic stress disorder. And then finally, gender plays a role as well. So on the whole, women tend to be at a greater risk of developing post-traumatic stress disorder compared to men. And then we can also understand peri-traumatic risk factors. So these are the risk factors during the trauma's occurrence. So things about the trauma itself that might play a role in determining your risk for developing post-traumatic stress disorder. And so one is level of exposure. Was this a direct or indirect exposure to the traumatic event? So did it happen to you personally? Did you witness this event very close by? Were you, you know, did it happen to a loved one or were you exposed repeatedly? And then also the intensity of the event and aspects of the event itself. And so things like a very intense event might be one where you thought you might die, where you felt very powerless to do anything about it. And that factors like that that can create a very intense event and very intense events are more likely to be associated with post-traumatic stress disorder. 
finally your perception of the event. So similarly, did you perceive or feel like you were about to die or that you felt very powerless? And then dissociation. So this is a, another protective factor. So the feeling of leaving your body, not really being connected to your body or to your environment, which is our mind's way of protecting itself. But we do also find that individuals who dissociate during the trauma or to dissociate afterwards are also at a higher risk factor for developing PTSD. And then finally, we have post-traumatic risk factors. So these are things that occur after the trauma that might play a role in impacting uh, the development of PTSD. So negative appraisals about the event itself. So thinking back on some of those symptoms that we went through, the negative thoughts and beliefs about the event might be, you know, this was my fault or I shouldn't have been there. Uh, coping strategies, so engaging in coping strategies that are not effective following the trauma, so perhaps engaging in heavy substance use, uh, things like that might create an increased risk for post-traumatic stress disorder, and then as well environmental risk factors. So similarly to the pre-traumatic risk factors, um, in a post-traumatic risk factor as well, having an environment that is not supportive, environment that's a little bit chaotic, or very importantly, if you are in an environment where you are likely to be exposed to additional traumatic experiences, that can very much play a role in individuals developing post-traumatic stress disorder. And then finally, to end things on a little bit of a positive note, there are protective factors as well. So we do find that social support is a protective factor. So an individual who has undergone a trauma, uh, a post-traumatic protective factor is social support and it does provide kind of a buffer effect against developing post-traumatic stress disorder. And so now that we have a little bit of understanding about what is PTSD, who is likely to develop it, and how does it look for somebody who might have it, now we'll go on to discussing a little bit about how we might treat post-traumatic stress disorder.